Welcome everybody. Uh, let's get into this. It, this is the software process track. Can people hear me at the back? Awesome. All right, I'm Rashina Hoda. I'm an associate professor in software engineering at Monash University, so a local. Um, welcome everybody again to Melbourne. Hope you've had a chance to look around. We've got seven amazing talks lined up. The first of which is a theory of Scrum team effectiveness by Daniel Russo and Christian Verwis. I hope I got that right. Um, yeah, over to you, Daniel. Hello, everyone. I hope that you are well after yesterday's party. Uh, I um, am, am here today to present this uh, uh, journal first paper um, that I quoted with my uh, industrial PhD student, Christian. I uh, hope that you are not falling uh, asleep today after a great party yesterday for uh, a bunch of reasons. Uh, I, I think this is actually a, a nice case of uh, collaboration with uh, uh, industry. Uh, it's a fairly long study, so it lasts uh, overall seven years to uh, get it all uh, uh, completed. We were able to uh, survey 13 different uh, uh, case studies and uh, to um, have samples of uh, almost 5,000 uh, uh, agile team members and aggregated in 2,000 teams. Uh, luckily, we have a very high reliability of our results. And uh, uh, because of the research design, a very high ecological validity, what does it mean? It means that we are actually quite confident that the uh, uh, research findings actually represent the reality uh, of, uh, of industry. Uh, our core findings, we uh, developed this specific type of theory based on five core uh, factors that shape uh, Scrum team effectiveness. Um, we have a very high fit of our data within the theoretical model, and which, by the way, is able to uh, explain team effectiveness uh, above 75%. Just for you to have a reference, uh, everything that's above 26% is considered to be a very high uh, explainability uh, uh, capability. Uh, we have here 75%, uh, which is, uh, uh, I would say, substantially high. And finally, uh, this model is actually in use right now uh, in several organizations uh, to improve uh, uh, their own development processes. Now, why did we actually study uh, this subject at all? Well. Uh, we have plenty of professional opinions out there. Uh, I don't know if you tried it out, but uh, uh, I did just for fun, you know, just try to ask uh, these big uh, uh, agile gurus uh, about why they think their own framework works uh, uh, actually better than another, which type of evidence do they have, and so on and so forth. And the typical answer that you get from those people is, uh, you know what, I have like 50 plus years of industry experience, I know what I'm talking about, right? So that's the typical answer that I used to get from these people, um, and that's actually what, as a scientist, let me think, well, you know what, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're right, but however, you know, I want more, more hard data to validate uh, uh, everything. And actually, if you think about what are we really concerned you know, because it's not about following some specific recipe, but what we are really concerned is about making our software teams more effective. That's the ultimate goal, what I think we should achieve, regardless of which type of framework we are using, XP, Scrum, Safe, whatever, right? So I think that this is relatively less important compared to what makes teams actually more effective. And what does Scream effectiveness mean? Well, we used this fairly old and well-established reference uh, from uh, Hackman of 78, which defines Scream effectiveness, uh, team effectiveness as the degree to which a team meets the expectation of the quality of the outcome. So it's basically a shared decision within the team and outside the team about the quality of the outcome. 
Now, uh, since time is running out, we run this uh, uh, case study divided in two main phases, a multiple case study and then uh, a, a quantitative uh, um, case. Again, we uh, run these 13 different multiple case studies uh, in several software industries, uh, um, multinational uh, but, but mostly European based, um, uh, along almost all type of industries. We identified, first of all, lower order factors, uh, which uh, were eventually uh, classified and identified uh, through our qualitative process and with the help of literature into uh, a higher order factor model, which eventually uh, resulted in a testable theory that can be uh, seen actually here. Um, I think also one of the most uh, uh, interesting part, uh, uh, also for you, of this uh, investigation is uh, how we were actually able to collect uh, quantitative data of uh, above uh, 2,000 teams, and this is why I would like uh, now my, my co-author to explain it to you in a few words. I'm the co-author of the paper that Daniel Russo is presenting here today. And in this short video, I want to show you how we were able to get 2,000 teams to participate in our study. We've created a free tool that Agile and Scrum teams can use as part of the continuous improvement loop that they're in anyways because of their iterative approach to development. And they can use the questionnaire uh, and fill it in and distribute it among team members, maybe before a sprint retrospective. And then we send them a team report and the team report shows them the results of the questionnaire uh, on the factors that we're measuring. But it also gives them a lot of actionable tips on things that they can potentially improve, which is all based on my own experience as a Scrum Master and of Barry Overeem, my partner at the Liberators. They can also download a lot of do-it-yourself workshops that they can run for free uh, within their own team to drive improvement. And by creating something that's useful to teams and also useful for us as academics to collect data and analyze it, we've been able to cr uh, collect data from about 10,000 teams and 25,000 team members, uh, but also stakeholders and supporters like managers. So there's a lot more data that we can analyze. So stay tuned and uh, enjoy ICSI. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good. Uh, the result, as I was able to uh, explain before, were uh, uh, quite quite good. So we have a very high model fit uh, and uh, an uh, uh, R square of uh, above 75%. Uh, In uh, a nutshell, what are our findings? Uh, well, first of all, we can actually explain quite well uh, Scrum team effectiveness uh, within uh, five core models. Uh, we see that the most effective uh, teams are those uh, who have uh, a fairly high release frequency, at least once after every sprint. The shared product ownership is quite essential uh, to make the team work quite well also with, uh, uh, the, um, with the product ownerships. Team autonomy and continuous improvement create the right conditions for uh, this type of effectiveness. Last but not least, and that's probably not particularly surprising, is that management uh, uh, plays a key role to provide this type uh, of uh, positive environment. Now, uh, where is our uh, future uh, directed? We have um, some publications uh, uh, lined up uh, uh, with, uh, first of all, having a deeper look into the role of diversity of, uh, of, of teams. Uh, we are also uh, going to see how scaling frameworks impact agile teams uh, and spoilers, uh, they do not. Um, and now we are mostly also transitioning to investigate the role of fluid, uh, fluid teams. Now, uh, we here at ICSI would like also to make a call because what uh, our plan for the next years is to import all this data into a foundation. And the, the, the overall idea is to establish a uh, kind of an open science accelerator where different teams uh, uh, from different universities across the world are supposed to work together to investigate uh, different aspects related to, uh, to software teams. So please stay tuned and uh, happy to uh, get your questions. Thank you so much.
questions, uh, I saw a hand at the back. Uh, we're just wanting to use the microphone so people who are online can hear us. Uh, Sebastian Proksch, TU Delft. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, I was wondering to which extent did you also consider um, developer satisfaction in, in your model? Um, because I, I, mean, I saw that T Morel was on, on, the, on one of the slides, um, because I guess uh, like satisfaction also has a big effect on the sustainability of a model, like whether you can actually stick to it over a longer time. Um, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So it, it has been again uh, operationalized uh, through uh, different uh, uh, levels, especially team effectiveness uh, uh, has been operationalized uh, as an order factor of uh, team morale and stakeholder satisfaction, which is basically an intrinsic and extrinsic evaluation of what actually team effectiveness. And I completely under, uh, agree with you, by the way. There are quite a few questions, so forgive my humanness in trying to spot people. Uh, I saw Ida first. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Great presentation. Thank you. Ita Richardson from Lero and the University of Limerick. So I suppose I'm interested in diversity and I'm kind of curious if you think, I mean, I don't know whether you've broken down the model, but whether that model that you have uh, will be the same, say, for women and men, or have you looked, and also have you looked at other diversities? Uh, yeah, actually, we have looked at a, a bunch of different diversities, and I uh, actually welcome you to download the, the preprint, which is uh, under review uh, right now. Uh, we looked into um, age, cultural diversity, uh, tenure, uh, also including gender, and, uh, and so on. And afterwards, I would actually be more than happy to talk about you, because actually the results are quite uh, um, counterintuitive, I would say. Yeah. Cool, we've got a next one here. Hi, this is very interesting. Uh, if, if I squint, this seems to rhyme fairly reasonably with the DORA metrics. Uh, have you looked at the, the results out of that and how those sort of line up with organizational and team effectiveness? Uh, I have no idea about DORA metrics. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you later then. Great. <laughs> Chat over coffee. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Mahdi from University of Southern Queensland. Could I see your theoretical model that you developed? The theoretical model. Uh, the model that, yeah. yeah is it uh, yeah, the next one? Yeah, uh, did you develop from scratch or did you use a pre-existing theory to? Yeah, yeah, great. So uh, this is actually a, a, a mixed method type of study. So we spent, uh, 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 basically five years uh, running 13 different multiple case studies, uh, which allowed us uh, to identify what uh, can be basically here seen as the so-called lower order factor that has been, again, aggregated through a qualitative type of approach into higher order ones uh, and eventually uh, into theories. Uh, that is actually the result of both the qualitative process uh, and the results uh, in literature. Hi, uh, Isam Sedki, University of Concordia. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering if you can give us some insight about how you measured some intangible uh, values, like uh, focus on value, customer satisfaction, quality, team morale, because these are kind of difficult to measure or assess. Yeah. It depends from one yeah. context to another. Absolutely. Uh, luckily, uh, management and organizational psychology literature comes uh, in our help. Uh, and we used uh, uh, actually already existing instruments uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, our fit uh, value and the reliability of these instruments in our case was actually quite high. But, but we use already established instruments and in the paper you can actually find those instruments and the reference of such instruments. So as a follow-up question, how do we make sure like, this is uh, same across different companies? Because you mentioned like 2000. So many companies have different instruments and measures? No, no, actually. So we only uh, use, at least for a survey case, self-reported measures. So this was actually the, the team members and the team who, based on this well-established type of instruments, uh, uh, reported the results, which are the same for everyone, by the way. Yeah. Awesome. Rapid question answering, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Please uh, join me in thanking Daniel once more. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Pimpe and um, 
I'm a first year PhD student at Dallas University, Canada. And I am opportune to work with Sean and Erin, who are um, undergraduate research assistants at our lab. And also, we worked on this study with the support of our supervisor, Dr. Paul Raff. Um, unfortunately, Sean is not able to attend ICSI, so I will be presenting this paper on our behalf. So I am actually happy to finally present my paper since Sunday that I've arrived. It's been a long wait, and I'm happy to enjoy the rest of ICSI after presenting these papers. <laughs> So um, sustainability is stratified towards a better theory of sustainable software engineering. So many, um, Maybe just use the okay. So, um, so many um, conference speakers have emphasized the undeniable truth that the world's reliance on technology is rapidly increasing. Um, it has also been projected by, that by 2030, IT systems would be consuming approximately 10% of global electricity. These issues have brought the topic of sustainability to the forefront of global concern. And what we are trying to do here is to conduct, um, I mean, what we did was to conduct a scoping review of existing literature on sustainable software engineering. And by definition, sustainable software engineering means creating software that meets the present needs without undermining our collective capacity to meet future needs. So um, we wanted to understand the current state of research on sustainable software engineering, see what we can deduce from it, and then generate a better theory of sustainable software engineering. So um, we aim to answer this research question, what is the current state of research on sustainability in software engineering? To address the question, we conducted a scoping review, like I said earlier, and um, on existing literature on sustainable software engineering. And then we carried out a qualitative meta-synthesis of the included primary studies. And then we um, came up with an improved theory of sustainable software engineering. So this Prisma diagram showed the steps we followed in conducting the scoping review. The first thing we did was to apply our search criteria to um, five databases. Uh, IEEE, Explore, HCM, and so on. And we also included archive to, I mean, mitigate publication bias. After the search, um, a total of 961 papers were imported for screening. And um, after um, applying our inclusion exclusion criteria, which I won't go into details to save time, um, a total of 243 papers were finally included. Um, the data extraction took place simultaneously with the full test review, and the data we extracted included the title of the papers, how sustainability was defined in the papers, the dimensions of sustainability that were considered, the focus of um, sustainability in the paper, the aim, the objective, and so on. And this is, a, I don't know if you can see it, the larger screenshot of some of the papers that we Analyze. So now to um, our key findings. After the, uh, based on the data we extracted, we found about 155 papers focused on sustainability of software products, and 42 papers were focused on the sustainability of software process, and 46 papers focused on both. In terms of the sustainability dimensions considered in the papers, we identified um, that the ecological dimension of sustainability actually received um, more attention compared to the social and individual dimension. And um, based on the number of papers published by year, we found the highest number of papers published in 2018. And yeah, so we also looked at the methodologies adopted in these papers, and we found that most of the papers that were published between, of course, the, the, year of, the year we looked at was between 2012 and 2021. So papers published before then or after 2021 may not be in our sample. So 118 were non-empirical. And for the empirical studies, the most commonly used methodology were systematic review, case study, 
non-randomized technical experiments, and so on. So now to our theory. So we, like I said earlier, we conducted the metasynthesis of um, the included qualitative studies, and we came up with um, six key propositions and um, this model of sustainable software engineering. So sustainability is stratified. What does this tell us? Um, it means that sustainability is not just a single, like uniform concept, but it's um, a complex and multifaceted issue that composed of uh, multiple layers and strata. And we try to show that in our model, um, each of the sustainability dimension like, consists of multiple layers represented by the color gradient in the model there. And sustainability can actually have different meanings at each layer from micro to macro. To illustrate this clearly, when we talk about um, environmental sustainability, which relates to um, the responsibility of IT system to preserve the natu natural environment, we may be looking at it from um, the direction of um, the planet or a specific ecosystem or a tiny patch of bacteria. A project may appear sustainable at one level and may seem unsustainable at another level. So that explains the stratification of um, sustainability in, as we've defined in our model. Okay, so the next proposition says um, sustainability is multi-systemic, and this simply means that um, sustainability emerges from the interaction between several subsystems, and it is really important to assess these subsystems to come up with um, a sustainability assessment of the entire system. And we also try to illustrate that in our model. For each of the dimensions, we can see the relationship between um, the several subsystems that makes up the entire, the entire system. The third um, proposi proposition says process sustainability differs from product sus uh, sustainability. Um, this means that the of course, process sustainability refers to the processes that promote sustainability um, among software development teams. And a product is sustainable if, of course, it contributes to reduced energy consumption or if, uh, based on its um, longevity, durability, and reusability. Um, this is also related to, to the previous proposition, and it, um, Technical sustainability is a product and not a process attribute. This is also like closely related to what I said earlier. I'm just gonna rush through the last two propositions. Process determines products. The processes um, adopted during software development actually contributes to the qual um, quality or characteristics of the final product that is eventually produced. And lastly, Sustainability is participatory. Um, this also means that um, the sustainability of a system involves the participation of diverse user groups, consultation of multiple stakeholders to ensure that their um, concerns are well captured during the decision making process. Okay. So um, I'm just going to. Um, read through the conclusion. What exactly did we, are we saying here? Um, the, firstly, the gaps we observed in the current scope of literature on sustainable software engineering implies that the common understanding we have in sustainability, especially in software engineering, they are largely um, speculative. Based on the analysis we did, we found about 216 papers that are non-empirical, which means that the Papers were basically or largely opinion papers, position papers, which is actually very important because they are creating awareness, talking about sustainability. But it is really important for us to um, further or take this um, research further by conducting research that actually validates sustainability improving interventions. And um, also, if we, are, if we want to access the sustainability of a system, software system, it is important to identify the relevant strata, identify the layers and subsystems, and observe the impact of sustainability 
on these strata or systems. And lastly, um, it is important to examine the impact of software product or software process for each of the dimensions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Questions for Bimpi? Yep. Do you have any examples of the types of things that come up in, in technical sustainability? Uh, it's certainly a thing that I worry about a lot in industry, and I don't hear a lot of people talking about it. Yeah, so um, technical sustainability actually refers to the long-term durability or viability of a software product. But generally, the conception we have, we always mix it up with the software process, and that is one of the things we try to clarify in our model. So technical sustainability is strictly related to the product, the longevity, the reusability, maintainability of um, a software product. So yeah. Uh, any other questions? Patricia, did you have a question on sustainability? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Thank you very much for presentation. Uh, did you consider the software process equal with the software development methodology? The yes, you mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the software development methodology constitutes three main components, the process, yeah. the product that you covered, and also development roles. Uh, did you consider the definition of the software development methodology, and if so, uh, did you consider the role of software development roles or aspect of software development roles? Yeah. So um, when we said software processes determines the software product that is eventually produced, we're talking about practices or the methods adopted in, during the software development life cycle. For example, peer programming code review has been found to contribute to um, software, I mean, okay, let me look. Let me use human-centric design, for example, or the use of personas have been found to contribute to um, the development of software that consider human needs or human values. So soft, when, we, when we say software product, we are actually referring to practice. Um, um, when we say software process, we are actually referring to practices, methodologies, or all practices that contribute to sustainable software development. Okay, Patricia has a question after all. <laughs> Can well, we please get someone to... One question about the, the, the search screen that you carried out. So basically, I was wondering, you, you limit your search stream to sustainability in general and environmental dimension, but on the other hand, you also classify the, the studies for all the dimension of sustainability. So why do you limit yourself only to this sustainability or green or ecological? Okay, um, I think what we focused on was um, the sustainability of software engineering, of software processes, of software requirement, of software products. But in some papers, um, I think the, um, some, people, uh, some people use ecological or um, green in terms of sustainability when they are trying to portray the idea of sustainability. So that's why we add sustainability or green or ecology and software development, software engineering, software design, or software requirements. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but if it doesn't, we can't talk about it after that. Yeah. yeah talk over lunch. All right, please join me in thanking Bimpi again for an amazing talk. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Samuel Ferino. I'm from Brazil. And I will present our paper of Economic Challenge and DevOps Education through teaching methods. Our contributions are the identifications of eight, uh, 18 interview derived teaching methods and 44 links between teach methods and developed education challenges. So first of all, for context, DevOps is 
a set of principles and practices enforcing collaboration between development and the operations. The word DevOps is a merge between Dev development and Ops operations, and it has it has it aims to reduce the time between a new commit by a software developer and the exact commit being reverberated and deployed and the production environment be available for the final use user. And at the same time, it seeks to accomplish this process by relying on high quality and reliability. Uh, looking for DevOps benefits, the industry has a significant interest in adopting this practice. Uh, in the same way, there is a demand for the formation of qualified professionals in these skills. And both academy and industry has potential to contribute uh, to this. For these reasons, it's relevant to talk about uh, how to incorporate DevOps into competing course. And in this sense, teach methods stand as a fundamental and important educators too. It involves principles, uh, procedures, strategies implemented by the educator. As when non teach methods, we have traditional lectures and project-based learning. And uh, however, despite this, there is a limited number of papers related to teach methods in DevOps. And the work paper was the first to analyze teach methods by talking with uh, DevOps educators. Our study aims to investigate in teach methods using uh, used in DevOps teaching experience. And to accomplish this, we analyzed 14 interviews with educators published in a previous study. In this sense, we delineated two research questions. The first question helps us to identify the teaching methods and approach used in DevOps course. And the second question focuses on understanding how teaching methods can contribute to mitigate, mitigating challenges and faith in, in DevOps course. The study methodology is, is organized in two phases. First, is the work, we work on the identifications, uh, identification of the teach methods. We extract snippets that appear to have mentioned teach methods. Then we analyze all snippets or code resulted in the teach methods. For instance, we have this snippet uh, that clearly it has a uh, uh, teach methods. We have this. They learn how to work in a team and team building. This NIPT stands for collaboration learning. After this, we asked for help for the interview participants. And we send the teach methods that we identify. Uh, and we got 18, one percentage of strong agreement. We identify the link between teach methods and challenge in the second phase. From our previous study, we built a set of 558 links between general education recommendation to education challenges. In this way, we identify 44 links incorporated at each method in the recommendation. For example, we have a recommendation regarding the usage of problem-based learning. Uh, now let's present some highlights of our results. Uh, Project-based learn stood up as a recurrent uh, teach method. Uh, we identified that it is essential to be concerned about planning the project requirements. And it also, the, the students contribute to open source projects. It uses popular DevOps tools, uh, which can install and run on students' computers. Moreover, it given the examples of project accomplishes a project requirement. Collaborative learning also stood up as a teach math as a teach method. One of the professor explains to the students that is it is their responsibility to motivate their team. It is also important to be concerned about difference in teams team members' environment. It involves difference in software versions that could break the Build the process. In this sense, we have a containerization as a solution to this challenge. Uh, in addition to this, it is also created a workshop workspace to enable interaction between professor student and student student. We also identified that it's crucial uh, that the labs should focus on practicing the DevOps concepts instead of 
focus on mastering tools. It's not the responsibility of the educator to train students to be uh, cabinet professionals, for instance. It is also interesting to use the open source tools used by the community to enable realistic environment. Uh, furthermore, it's, it is interesting to invite industrial lectures to share their experience. Regarding the second research question, we highlight two links between teach methods and the challenge. The first one involves the difficulty of doing hands-on sessions in large class. For this, for this we it recommend organize the students and teams. And the second link has the challenge of teaching develop to students with no industrial back experience. So this background in the industry as is helpful for the students to understand the nu nuance of DevOps. Uh, it recommends in this case a personalization of the teaching according to the class context. For instance, for students with a lack of background in Linux, the educator can share tutorials or create labs or also encourage discussions. We also compare our results with those available in the literature. A similarity, both have project-based learning and collaborative learning as the most recurrent teach method. You also have a similar set of teach methods as identified in the literature. About the difference, uh, we have teach methods such as game-based learning and storytelling uh, only in the papers. On the other hand, uh, personalized learning and feedback session only appears uh, in the interviews. We also select available lessons for le lesson learning for educators. We identify the importance of uh, using practical teach methods. Project-based learning, labs, and collaborative learning are among the most recurrent uh, teach methods. In addition, uh, collaborative learning is stand out as a teach method that allows students to explore the concept of a collaborative culture. There is a main DevOps topic. Uh, this concept encourages open collaboration between the actors of the software development process, devs, ops, uh, something that is difficult to achieve in practice. Everybody knows this. And furthermore, it's interesting to invite in industrial professionals that can share their experience as well, provide mentoring. On the other hand, as a research opportunity, we recommend students seeking to understand what is, is the impact of DevOps course on improving the soft skills on students. We believe in a positive potential, knowing that there is studs not in the context of DevOps, unfortunately, but they see that collaborative learning enables the enhancement of teamwork and leadership skills. We, in addition, we identify a lack of studies focused on industrial contents. This context involves uh, more hard time constraints than academy. Uh, we also believe there is the possibility of recommending more teaching methods increase the educator arsenal. In this regard, we recommend teaching methods that is involved in hands-on activities and interaction between students as they appear to be, an, uh, to be allied with DevOps practice. As possible future work, we recommend exploring and combining new teach methods that includes improvement of the educate, educational tools by including more education, more recommendation, or addressing more teach methods. And that's it, thank you so much. Some questions, plenty. Um, so our hand here. Uh, do you think it's academia's responsibility to teach this? I think it's really hard to have those things be authentic. So I've yeah. been struggling with this. Yeah, I understand because DevOps involves many topics, but I think it's your responsibility for the educator. Uh, teach the concepts, as I said before. In fact, there are mentors, cabinets, uh, a doc, you have a sort of tools, uh, but we as educators, we have to focus on concepts because tools, we have 
uh, today we have Cabernet, uh, tomorrow we could have another, or in other countries we have a, a AWS for cloud, but we also could use the Google Cloud Platform. So uh, the concepts are more important. I like that answer. Thank you. Great answer, learning to learn, right? So I think it was Ita and then the gentleman at the back. I thank you very much for that really interesting talk. So I'm just wondering, um, I think you mentioned problem-based learning on one of your earlier slides, and then you particularly talked about project-based learning, which is fine, they're two different yeah. types of learnings. But I'm curious if people in the interviews talked about, because they were all educators, actually getting training in those techniques, yeah. which I do think is very important. It's difficult because uh, DevOps is new. So for, profession, for professors, they couldn't learn about DevOps. In, no, I'm not talking about oh. the DevOps. I'm talking about the um, teaching approaches. Teaching approach, yeah. So did oh. people get training in the teaching approaches before okay. they kind of took them on? Okay, I think it's common for uh, professionals in computer science not be a uh, educational background. So we, we don't have this uh, when we started to teaching. So we just uh, have a computer science background, unfortunately. And so in this sense, the professor sometimes uh, use a teaching method even they don't know they are using. So that's why we had to analyze it and try to figure out what they are using. As an example, they use someone use example based learning. So they, uh, but they don't uh, didn't say ex uh, exactly example based learning, but they are using. So, okay. So uh, I suppose I would say under the recommending new teaching methods that there should you should also be looking at recommending training in the new teaching methods. That's all, it's just a comment. Uh, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think you've done great work and it's just another uh, maybe uh, future. I understand, but I think it, there are many uh, uh, concepts for the educator learning and uh, I know it's difficult, but I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian Proksch, to your um, Thank you for the presentation. I think it's um, uh, important research, but um, from your uh, implications, it seems that most of the implications are actually addressing teamwork and collaborative software engineering and not really DevOps uh, in, a, in a sense. Um, so in my course, I'm um, yeah, always struggling a bit, in, and probably this follows the, the comment of, of our uh, Google fellow here, um, um, creating like concrete examples where people actually understand how to um, identify what to automate in their process. Because I guess in DevOps, automation is one of the core ideas, right? You try to identify the, the biggest pain point, you want to automate that, and how can we create like realistic examples where we can actually assess our students able to identify what is a pain point for them. Okay. Uh, do we have any insights on that? Let me uh, I'm agree with you, but let me addict to uh, your comment. I think DevOps involves automation, but uh, the focus, automation is one of the paths, but the focus is uh, break the, uh, short the time between comments. So for this, we have collaboration as a, uh, as a fundamental. And the collaboration is one of the, the uh, most primary fundamental of DevOps. And uh, I agree with you. A collaboration is not that one, unique because uh, it is very easy. I talk about it. Uh, I have to collaborate to my colleague, but the tools help me. Help me. And uh, we have so many tools, but uh, uh, soft excuses are, are difficult to achieve, so that's why we focus on how to about uh, sorry, we focus on soft skills in, in DevOps side. But they have also the automation as a as a result. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, uh, Samuel, for those very thoughtful and considered responses. I know there are more questions, but please feel free to catch um, Samuel during the lunch. And thank, uh, join me in thanking him again. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Nusrat Jahan. Today I'm going to present our paper on do software security practices yield fewer vulnerabilities. So let's get started to it. So in recent years, software supply chain attack has uh, have been changed. And nowadays, instead of looking for uh, existing vulnerabilities, attacker actually inject new vulnerabilities in software supply chain to execute uh, an attack. And recent report by, um, from Sonatype actually showed there is a 742% increase in software supply chain attack in over past three years. And the US government has recognized this urgent concern in section four of executive order 14028, where they calls for identifying practices and identifying and mandating security practices that actually improve software supply chain security. Apart from that, industry is also working towards the same goal. For example, um, Linux uh, OpenSSF, a uh, cross-industry organization hosted by Linux foundations, provide the vehicle for collaboration on security tools, for, ex uh, exam for example, like scorecard, Salsa, and they also provide guidelines on how to mitigate uh, so software supply chain security risk. Now, as a result, now we have lots of software security frameworks, security guidelines, security tools, and so many things. And from a practitioner's perspective, it is possible they can be overwhelmed and confused by the number of practices required in this framework, and they may not have all the resources to deploy all practices recommended in this framework. So, um, uh, and they want, uh, they want to know empirical evidence whether adopting a certain practices actually has meaningful impact on their uh, project securities. So this is what I, we want to do in these studies. Out of all of this framework, we want to focus on OpenSSF Scorecard, which is a security tool. And we want to see whether practices recommended in this tool are, has any meaningful impact on project security outcome. So the goal of this study is to assist practitioners and researchers in making informed decision on which security practices to adopt through the development of model between software security practice and security vulnerability count. So let's first start it. Uh, what is OpenSSF Scorecard? It is an automated tool that runs on GitHub repositories to provide the uh, status of project security health. And um, it, uh, it is designed to detect the security practice adoptions of a, um, uh, security practice adoptions of a project. And um, here in the right side of my uh, screen, you can, right side of my slide, you can see that there are some example of security practices that you can evaluate if you use a uh, scorecard in GitHub repositories. For example, by if you want to know whether a project has been maintained in last 90 days, you can use the scorecard or whether a project has a valid license or whether the project practice code reviewed before marching uh, it to the, uh, before uh, code is marched. So, and okay. Here in the next screen, you can see that you can run scorecard from CLI tool, and also it can be integrated in GitHub workflows. And um, uh, the left uh, screenshot actually showed you that you can run scorecard on a certain security practices, and you can know the reason behind a security, uh, behind a security practice why passed, or why a certain security practice actually failed with a detailed overview. And the right side of the screenshot actually showed you the list of practices that can be determined by, uh, by scorecard and their individual security score. And also they provide the aggregated security score of each project. So um, now that we all know a little bit about scorecard, let's think about it. There is no empirical evidence. I mean, the practice uh, recommended in scorecard definitely are well-intentioned, but there is no empirical evidence whether all the practices uh, recommended in scorecard are applicable for all the ecosystems. So in our research group, previously we studied scorecard tool for NPM and PyPI ecosystems. And while we try to understand whether all practices are applicable for NPM and PyPI ecosystems or not, our finding shows that, yes, not all the security practices recommended by scorecard are applicable for NPM and PyPI ecosystems. And also there is a gap in security practice adaptions for both ecosystems. And also we found that there are opportunities where scorecard tool can improve their automatic detection of security practice adaptions. Now, uh, from that prior studies, we, we were able to identify the evidence of security practice adoptions. Now, in this study, we want to see whether, this secu uh, whether the security practice adoptions actually lead to a better security outcome. And to that, in this studies, we have two research questions. 
First one is which scorecard security practice are most important to understand the relationship between uh, security practice and vulnerability counts. And the second research question that we are going to address, do package with higher aggregated security scores have fewer vulnerabilities? So here is the uh, um, um, research overflow of these studies where, as I mentioned, we have collected security practice code data from our prior uh, studies as an independent variable. And two, in literature, we found that number of vulnerabilities can be considered as one of the um, uh, metrics to measure security outcomes. So in these studies, we collected vulnerabilities data from OSV and SNIC for NPM and PyPI ecosystems. And overall, um, we are going to consider security practice and the, their aggregated security as score as our independent variable. And the vulnerability count is going to be considered as a security outcome or dependent variable. So like I mentioned, um, scorecard has, 50, um, from our prior study, we collected 15 security practice score from um, uh, generated by scorecard. And uh, uh, our, our, in our prior study, we showed that what are the practices that actually don't work for NPM and PyPay ecosystems. So for this study to remove the noise, we've, uh, we first removed signed release package and packaging and fuzzing because uh, scorecard uh, calculate this score inaccurately for NPM and PyPay ecosystems. Then to remove the bias, we remove the vulnerabilities matrix from our data set because uh, Scorecard also collect vulnerabilities information from OSV database, where, which, which database we also call Cinder for our security outcome matrix. And then at the end, we wanted to collect um, yeah, use security metrics that are statistically significant. So in that case, we use feature selection technique and we found that binary artifacts and dangerous workflow are not stat was not statistically significant for our model. So at the end of this stage, we have nine security practices and their security scores to answer our research question one. And here we wanted to, um, here we, we build supervised machine learning model to uh, evaluate the importance of each features for, uh, to understand the relationship between security practices and security outcomes. And as you can see here, our score, our R -score, score is less than 12% for uh, each model, which actually shows that probably there are other factors that actually impact the model apart from the security practices that we consider in our model. And um, um, okay. However, um, however, um, as you remember, all the practices that we have selected, they are statistically significant, which shows that there are some relationship between those security practice and security outcomes. And code review, maintain branch protection and security policy were the most important practices in, uh, in, the, in uh, for our research question one. And one, uh, another interesting thing I want to highlight here that, that code review and branch protection were also important practices for Maven ecosystem, which was a con research conducted by Sonatype, re uh, Sonatype Research. Then in our uh, second research question, we wanted to see whether the security, uh, aggregated security score actually leads to a better security outcome. So here our hypothesis was that packages with higher security scores promote better security practices and contain ex uh, fewer externally reported vulnerabilities. However, our hypothesis was rejected by showing positive relationship between aggregated security score and their vulnerability count, which actually made us think about that whether the vulnerability count is the right matrix to, uh, as a security outcome for this kind of studies or what are the other practices, sorry, other security outcome matrix that we should consider. So here, um, I mean, in the paper, we have elaborately discussed what are the challenges that we have in these studies the, so that prevents us to achieve uh, desired outcome. However, today, for, for this session, I'm going to talk about the one of the most prime challenge, which is like, what are the security outcome metrics that we should consider because of scarcity of vulnerability data in our, at least available vulnerabilities data, because we don't have access to all the vulnerabilities that we have uh, in those security advisories. and. Uh, I would like to have your feedback on uh, uh, what are the metrics we can consider because vulnerability count can be very debatable because probably it is effective if the mat, uh, independent variable are uh, vulnerability detection technique, but when we want to identify the relationship between vulnerability count versus the developer activities in terms of security practice adoptions, vulnerability count can be very debatable. 
And uh, to summarize this study, we, uh, from our research question one, we identified maintain code review, branch protection, and security policy were important metrics in our model. And our prior study shows that both ecosystem, NPM and PyPy, has gap in adopting these practices. However, this, in the, uh, this study indicated that adopting these practices has an impact on package security. And also, our second, second research question found that package with increased good practices score also had increased vulnerability count, which actually showed us that uh, probably we have to consider other vulnerability outcome, sorry, security outcome metrics, uh, considering the control variable and class, um, doing clustering in our data sets. Also, we have discussed the challenges in current data set and what are the future direction uh, for improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Rath. Questions. Thank you. Really good work. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so the increased security vulnerability count is so vulnerability counts is an interesting metric because like if I don't know anything about security today, I'm gonna report zero vulnerabilities. And then yeah. I learn more about security and I find more vulnerabilities tomorrow. So in some ways it's a reflection of what you're looking for, right? Exactly. And so, I and you talked a little bit about this, but I, I like, did, how does that impact? Have you considered that effect of like maybe more vulnerabilities means that they're learning more? Um, and how, how does that impact your results? So, so we try to look into that part because one of the possible way that if a package has more vulnerabilities, and I just want to mention that our vulnerabilities data set came from reported vulnerabilities. So it is possible that package were more popular, people identified more vulnerabilities, so we have more vulnerabilities. However, we started the study with 1 million GitHub repositories, and then we end up conducting this study on 2,400 packages which actually shows the uh, scarcity of vulnerabilities in the data set. So we couldn't actually verify what are the other cases if the package were not popular. So the data set that we had, they were very popular, so we could not actually claim confirmly because we did not have data set without popular packages. So maybe, pa I mean, people did not use it, so that's why we did not find vulnerabilities. So, But this is what we want to do in future for sure. So you said that there's no statistical significance on binary artifacts being yeah. part of the build. Uh, is that evidence that that's bad advice or just? So I, I think this is the thing we should study more because uh, I mentioned another study on Maven ecosystem where binary artifacts were significant and important metrics. But for JavaScript packages and PyPI packages, we could not find that binary artifacts was important. Be another reason could be that in our security score packages, there was not binary file in for JavaScript and PyPy. So I think we need to verify it a little bit more how it varies ecosystem to ecosystems. So because for Maven, it was important practices. Yeah. We are out of time. Awesome. Thank you so thank much, you. Uh, Nusrat. Um, we will end that here. Join me in thanking Nusrat once again. Hello, good evening in Seattle, good morning to Australia. I hope everyone is having a great conference so far and that this remote presentation goes well smoothly. Um, I'm Alex and I work at Microsoft. And in this talk, what we will do is I'm gonna walk you through some of the learnings that we have had while we tried and succeeded in integrating A-B testing into other products as a feature of those products. This paper is a collaboration between my colleagues from Microsoft and from Pavel, who is now at Outreach. And both teams that we work with, they, they are facing very similar opportunities in trying to make A-B testing a part of a different product. So a little bit of context about Microsoft EXP and the team that I work on. Now, we've been Microsoft's A-B testing or experimentation platform for over 15 years. And we operate at a very large scale. Um, tens of thousands of A-B tests are ran through our platform by product teams across Microsoft every single year to make informed data-driven decisions. 
we have a blog post where you can learn a little bit more about the work that we do. Um, and, and below, it's just a short disclosure that while I will be presenting the learnings of this paper today, um, I might also share some of the opinions uh, that are purely mine and from the authors. So let me first give you a little bit of context of A-B testing, just in case not everyone in the room is knowledgeable in this area or have seen this before. And after that, I'll share you the learning that I have for you. Now, in a very simple terms, A-B testing is the best scientific way to prove causality that one thing causes another thing to happen. And in the most possible simple A-B test, what you can do is you can take the devices that millions of uh, around the world exist and split them into two groups at random and give one group one experience and another group a different experience. And then you look at the telemetry and use statistical tests to determine the statistical significance and decide whether one group is having a better experience than the other. So this is a very simple uh, design of an A-B test, but this scales very well. And to give you one concrete example, here's an A-B test that one of our partners, MSN, has ran a few years ago, um, where they have been testing a control variant on their web page that had 12 cards and comparing it to 16 cards just to see how will that impact the product uh, and its usage. Now, while this is just a simple example to explain how A-B testing might work like, A-B testing goes way beyond just UX testing, like here. Um, in fact, um, we really benefit from A-B testing to make safe velocity decisions for most changes shipped to, to, to our products, um, and also to understand what is really valuable for our users. So this might include UX like here, but it can go way, way beyond the backend as well in changing, um, changing our services and measuring the impact there measuring performance and seeing how things change if we have a different experience. Now, what is interesting here is we've previously talked a lot about A-B testing at ICSI as well. We've shared a few different papers on this topic that you can find online, where we talked about the importance of the platform and the features that we have to offer A-B testing to our product teams. In this paper, what we have done differently is we've shared how we integrate A-B testing into other products and then offer that as a feature to, to customers. So the below line gives a, the boxes below give a, give a good illustration of this, where you take an A-B testing platform, you integrate it into some other product. In this paper, we talked a lot about Azure PlayFab, which is one of our products. And then how this product is then offering A-B testing to their customers and users to make good informed decisions. And, and what was interesting is that over the years, as we've done these different integrations, we came to some learnings. Um, in this paper, we presented seven of them. Um, we will not have time today to go through all of them. And I highlighted some of them here on the screen that I will discuss. You can feel free to ask me for, about others in the end. But some important things that we did arrive to is that to offer A-B testing as a feature, we had to really build out our API and software development kit SDK infrastructure so our integrators can easily integrate with the actual platform. We have to, imp we have to improve how metrics are being edited and defined so A-B integrators can measure the things that are important for them. And then, of course, we, we had to make it easy for compute metrics make it possible to make A-B testing be part of config services, reuse a lot of the, our UI to help those teams scale, and then at the end, make it very easy to educate new teams, new people on how they should use A-B testing in these new products, and importantly, surface any validations issues. Because what's the most important part, the reason you do all this thing called A-B testing is to make a trustworthy decision. And to do that, you have to surface any, mis any imbalances of any, anything that could go wrong with your design of an A-B test. So the first learning here was on the developing API and SDK infrastructure. Um, and this was really different for us because 
in our internal teams. A lot of the usage happens through our UX. We provide a web page. You can go there, start your A-B test, you know, continue, stop it. But for integrations, all this happens through an API layer. Systems talk to each other. So we had to rebuild and make this system very useful to developers. Um, and um, for, with this, we have relied a lot on something what we call an Azure Stewardship Board. Uh, which is a board of experts that give good input on how to design APIs. And we highly recommend if you're building similar platforms to, to do this kind of reviews with similar boards in your companies and collaborations. And as we were building a lot of this infrastructure, we had to build automation into it to make it easy for developers to diagnose any potential issues, statuses of the tasks that were previously maybe surfaced only in the UX. One new area that we started, which we didn't previously um, uh, work on that much, was event-driven architecture. So um, we built a system where we can expose the important events to developers when an experiment operation has started, stopped, or maybe finished. And they can use that to make certain decisions on, on when is the time to, to show certain information to their customers. This was new for us, but it became very useful, and it became useful even for our internal customers over the time. Um, and finally, in this infrastructure part, um, one thing that we did is we, we built our SDKs on top of the APIs using automation scripts that automatically compile the code from a definition into multiple languages, which makes it very easy for us to start offering integration with the platform in one language like C Sharp, but then extend it to other languages like Python or anything else that we might need with our, our developers. This was a very important platform learning that helped us scale and support more integrators. Um, on the metrics area, there were two important learnings we wanted to share. One of them is that internally, when we worked with our partners directly, we gave them the opportunity to build their own metrics that are important to measure for their products. But when it came to integrators, we identified that there can be metrics that are uh, actually useful for multiple of them. And what we've done is we built a predefined set of metrics that is useful for those integrators, and it's easier for them to then share that and scale. Uh, we still have to support the extensibility to add custom metrics, though, to make it possible to measure things that were not part of the package. And on the integrator side that is integrating with the platform, what they have benefited the most was when they standardized the telemetry into a nice contract that made it very easy then to measure what is important by creating metrics. When the contract is not clean, it can become very hard to define those metrics. On the education and culture, this was not a lot different than when it comes to 1P A-B testing. Um, we have continuously identified that experimentation or A-B testing is still a very hard thing to grasp for, for many teams or many customers, and that getting trustworthy telemetry, data that you can trust, um, is, it requires investments and it requires work and validations. Metrics need to be meaningful. Interpreting results as well might not be as intuitive, especially when they're measuring many important aspects. So. We tend to think we are right most of the time, and actually, you know, A-B tests show us that we're not. So building this, this, this momentum of trustworthiness through education was super important. Um, in particular, because a lot of things have to go right so you can trust your A-B test results. And this is even more important when there's an, another layer of integration happening. And our job is really to teach people, our integrators as well, how to do the fish, how to fish. Um, we do that through many different channels. Um, first, we provide and make sure that our product is trustworthy, that services important issues. We give talks to help people understand the value of A-B testing and classes to educate uh, everyone on how to do that. This was the same for 1P, but even more important for our integrators who are new to this. Provide very useful documentation and always there's a top-down buy-in This is important that we present to the leadership and get their uh, excitement so they're willing to take this important idea of trustworthy A-B tests and implement it in their organizations. 
from what we have the most control is what we can surface in our product directly. Um, and, and this was very important to do for our integrations, even more than our 1P UX usage, because integrators are then the ones who will take that information and do something about it and show it to their customers. So we had to build that validations and expose them directly through our infrastructure API layer. And we had to support multiple validations, including running AA test where everything is the same. We just make sure that there is no statistically significant difference. Supporting sample ratio mismatch tests where we want to assure that the split is balanced. And then we also have advanced checks. We publish some of them that we expose to our infrastructure to make sure that we surface any problems with validations. And last but not least, what was interesting as well is that as we have um, um, the multiple integrators that have worked with us, we had to also make sure that our platform itself is continuing to be um, valid, trustworthy, as we're adding new features and changes. Um, and one thing that we've continuously doing is now automatically run tests to create new uh, A-B tests um, automatically, check if analysis are properly scheduled and computed, and repeat this cycle every day. Um, and, make, and then we have the confidence that all the validation is in place. With that, I'm going to bring us here to the last slide, which is a, a good picture slide that summarizes the important learnings and invite the audience, of course, to go and read the paper and ask any questions that you might have about our work. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alessander. <laughs> All right. I hope you can hear us. Questions? I can hear you. Uh, Isam Sedki, University of Concordia, Canada. Thank you, Alexander, for the great talk. I hope you hear me well. I don't know if... Uh, okay, perfect. So um, I was wondering, like, uh, um, A-B testing as a feature of a product, what are the um, aspects that you have embedded in your study to consider reliability? Because one of the choices, like, need to be reliable in production, and doing the experiment with one feature needs to embed reliability as upfront design. So what are the, uh, the metrics? Because you talked about metrics. So how A-B testing in the product consider reliability and help enlighten the decision which direction to take in the product? Absolutely. It's a great question. We, we, first of all, there's a cultural aspect where we always encourage teams to, do, to have an A-B test, even if they're just testing out a bug fix, because everything can have unexpected consequences. So there's a culture aspect that must be um, uh, must be an initiative to A-B test. And then in the platform that you ask reliability, we have very core set of tests, like a sample ratio mismatch test, where we compare how was the experiment configured. For example, maybe the split was 20-20. And then we look at the numbers and use statistical tests like chi-square test to give you the back the result on whether the actual observed split has been seen. This test is super important. We do not even allow our A-B testers to, to look at the results of an A-B test uh, until uh, this test has passed. And then, of course, we, we talk about reliability more. We, we give capability for teams to configure alerts on their metrics, and they will receive notifications or in, the case of integrators, event with events that will tell them that something has gone wrong in the experiment, in the A-B test, because we again use different statistical tests to determine if there was a specific combination of, 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 of cohort that had very unusual data. So those are two example tests that we have, and we have a few more um, that, that we always surface for production A-B tests. We run also our own A-B tests all the time, continuously, programmatically, on our own that we built, which we know what the results have to be, so we can compare them and make sure that our platform continues to be trustworthy. I hope this helps. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, let's everybody join me in thanking Alessandro for a great presentation. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Daniela Grassi um, from the University of Bari and uh, I will be presenting our near paper 
uh, towards supporting emotional awareness in retrospective meeting. This is a joint work with uh, Indovin University of Technology, uh, focusing on uh, mm, development of a tool to uh, support emotional awareness in retrospective meeting. So why emotional awareness? Previous research has demonstrated that uh, emotion, the importance of emotion in software development to um, uh, um, to support the developers' well-being and productivity. Uh, the focus uh, of this work is on uh, agile uh, development teams, and in particular on uh, MedSed-led approach to retrospective meeting. <clears throat> this meeting, uh, during this meeting, uh, developers can discuss uh, on what went well and what went wrong during uh, the previous sprint, and um, uh, also um, uh, they can contribute uh, during, uh, this, during this uh, retrospective meeting, uh, writing cards uh, um, that are used uh, to discuss the problem encountered during the development activity in order to identify corrective action for uh, the the future iteration. Uh, to further support developers' emotional awareness, we developed a tool that combines multiple sources of information to help developers reflect on the emotion experienced during uh, uh, the development activity of the sprint. So this is an um, example of the tool that we developed. And um, uh, it includes the biometric signal, in particular the galvanic skin response, um, because uh, the um, previous research has demonstrated that the galvanic skin response is po positive, positively correlated with uh, stress and negative emotion. And negative emotion, uh, in particular, peaks of uh, the galvanic skin response uh, are correlated with uh, uh, stress events. So the um, biometric uh, are shown in combination with uh, self-reported positive and negative emotion um, activity and notes that developers could uh, uh, write in order to explain better why they were feeling uh, in a certain way. Um, so to evaluate our tool, we performed a pilot study and uh, four students were selected and they worked on a capstone project uh, following agile methodology. They uh, wearing wristband to capture biometric signal uh, and uh, answering to uh, a questionnaire in order to uh, acquire the self-report emotion. Uh, at the end, uh, so they worked on a, on a capstone project for uh, two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, uh, we, uh, we, the, they, the student participated uh, to our, our retrospective meeting uh, and they could access uh, to the tool, to the visualization, the visualization tool, in order to complete the MedSet GLAD retrospective. At the end of the retrospective meeting, uh, we had a final interview in order to understand if the tool was considered uh, useful. Okay. Doesn't we switch the slide? Okay. Here in this slide uh, are, uh, are reported some quotes uh, from uh, the interviews uh, to summarize our findings. In fact, the student reported that the tool uh, was useful for discovering negative emotion and the causes. And uh, as the quote suggests, suggest, this tool helped the participant to, to discover emotion they may not uh, be aware of. For example, one student said, I did not expect that creating UML diagram can be so stressful. And another participant say, thanks to the self-report, I gained insight on emotion I was not aware of. Moreover, the tool helped them to identify strategy to react to stress relief recommendation. Um, for example, one student said, I am usually unaware of my stress while studying, and this tool could help me to plan breaks when stress increases. 
So to recap, this is what we have done in this, during this study. And since the tool uh, was considered uh, informative and useful, we uh, now are conducting an extended study. In particular, uh, in the ongoing study, uh, two teams are involved during two agile iterations. In one iteration, uh, one, the, uh, one team operates in a control condition, so that means without tool and without biometric sensor, and uh, the other teams were um, behaves in a, in a um, experimental condition, so with the tool and with the, the biometric sensor. So we want to, um, to compare the two behavior, the two conditions, in order to uh, understand if the tool uh, is useful uh, uh, to, in order to enhance uh, emotion awareness. So. Thank you so Thank much, you. Daniela. <laughs> we have time for one quick question. Thank you very much for a nice presentation, interesting experiment. I would like to know what do you use when you uh, to uh, detect emotions from this EDA signal? So you have a signal, a biometric signal. What kind of processing do you use? Do you use machine learning or what do you use no, to no. Well, detect plotting, emotions? Because no, it's not easy. <laughs> yes, I know. No, the plotting is, uh, we plot the raw signal and we highlight the peaks of the, the electrodermal activity, mm -hmm. the, the GSR. So the vertical line uh, are the, the peaks of the signal. We pre-process <clears throat> the electrodermal activity uh, in order to clean the data, but uh, we don't use uh, machine learning. We all, we uh, combine the... Um, you look at the peaks only and you yeah. think this is stress? Yes. Okay. We assume that this, yeah, yeah. the peaks are stressed. Okay. Maybe in future we uh, substitute this, the self-report at the bottom of the uh, visualization tool with uh, some kind of so. uh, prediction yeah. of... Um, because stress is very difficult to measure and it changes in time. So yes. uh, these peaks are also varying. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Daniela, for a wonderful thank talk. Thank you. So, so hi everyone, I'm Pedro, I work at Stone, it's a Brazilian fintech. I'll be showing you how TDD, Test Driven Development, can help improve, to improve our developer experience. More, more specifically, I'll show you how, you can, how it can improve, uh, how you can help us to, to reach the so-called flow state. So I assume most of you know what Test Driven Development is, but anyway, it's a development technique. It says that you should write the tests before the production code, right? And it says that you should work in this kind of loops, this red, green effect or cycles. You should start by writing a failing test, then you write code that is just enough to make the test pass, then optionally you can refactor the code. That's how TDD says you should develop code. That's a small example, so if you are writing, for example, a password validation code, you should write first the test, the assertion, and then you write the production code. So people from academia has investigated whether TDD actually, actually produces better code, better designed code, uh, there is some consensus that if you write the tests before, it's good because it forces you to think on the problem specification, it will force you to think on the interfaces, on the modules. Code that is hard to test is probably code that is poorly designed. But what we are doing in this research is that we are bringing to the table another benefit, potential benefit of TDD, and we are connecting TDD with neuroscience. So that's a mental state, there's a mental state called flow state. Flow, so flow state is the mental state in which a person performing some activity is fully immersive in a feeling of high focus, fully, fully, full involvement and enjoyment. Uh, if you play video games, you know what I'm talking about. When we, we don't, you don't see time pass, you're fully focused. Uh, so there's a huge literature in neuroscience about flow state. Uh, 
it's a it's a concrete finding that if when you are in this state you are more productive you are more creative you are in a state of high focus and the neuroscience literature has found that there are some characteristics of a given task that if these characteristics are present you are more likely to reach the flow state so if the task has clear goals if the task shows a balance between your skills and the challenge you are tackling if the task has some feedback loops, and if the task gives you some sense of control, all of these are characters that helps you go into this flow state of high productivity and creativity. Uh, and what we, sh we do in this paper is that we show that TDD, it frames the development tasks in a way that favor favors us to reaching flow state. So what I'm doing now is that I go through each of these flow triggers that come from the neuroscience literature, and we'll briefly show you how TDD, test-driven development, helps us uh, achieving uh, flow state through these triggers, right? So for instance, the first flow trigger, clear goals. So in TDD, since we start with a test, the, this naturally leads you into defining a goal, right? And your, our brain loves when you are working towards a clear goal. The next flow trigger, feedback loops. This is the very nature of TDD, right? So you are all, when you run the test, you receive an immediate feedback loop. Either you quickly learn if your test passes or if your test fail. You always know what you should do next. You should either make a test pass or you should write a new test. So these feedback loops are, very, are the very nature of TDD. And our brain loves when we are, we, we are working on a task that has those feedback loops. The third flow trigger, challenge skill balance. So if you work in a task that's too hard, we don't like it because you go into a state of anxiety. Uh, if you're working a test that's too easy, you maybe become bored. And TDD helps you go into the middle ground because uh, it helps you breaking a large and complex problem in a more fine-grained problem. So every test you write, you increase the challenge of the problem, right? But on the other hand, you also learn more about the problem. So what we found out is that TDD helps you keep your brain in this flow state, well, flow channel, sorry, when there's a balance between the challenge and, the, and your skills. Finally, sense of control. So uh, you know what, what I'm talking about, right? When you run the test suite, everything is green, you feel relaxed, you feel under control of what you're doing. And our brain loves to be, uh, to, to sense that you are in, in control of what, are, what you're doing. Um, so, in addition to this like sort of theoretical connection between test-driven development and neuroscience, we did a survey with 86 uh, TDD practitioners. There is a well-known survey in the flow state literature. We adapted this survey to TDD, and, and our findings say, so show that experts and intermediate, intermediate TDD practitioners, they, they they feel that they are experiencing flow, so they say that, that they, knowing that they, the goal they need to accomplish is a good thing, uh, they recognize that they feel that when they write the tests before the code, it makes them more confident when, when they are working. Uh, they say that guiding the design by the test help them feel like they can control what they are doing. Uh, so that, that basically, the, our research, so I think the key takeaways here is that first, I think there's increasing recognition that flow state is a key dimension of developer experience, and more specifically to our research, uh, I would say that TDD structures the development task as a structured principal learning process, right? And that helps us to achieve the flow state, and flow state directly improves developer experience. Some future work we are considering, uh, we will investigate if we can find flow states in other engineering, software engineering process. We are looking at group flow uh, and maybe connecting AI systems with flow like, the, like how AI systems and humans work together. And if you are interested, I invite you to read the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have run out of time, so if you do have questions, please um, 
I'll follow Pedro into the lunch area. Very quick last announcements. Please do make sure you've filled out the survey, which is the QR code and at, on the door as you walk out. But also please um, join me in thanking two, two people, especially um, Dulaji, who is our wonderful student volunteer who managed this so well, and our tech, super tech team for doing the Zoom stuff at the back. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.